We work with a lot of different businesses, anywhere from a small nonprofit charity to a large multi-million dollar uh, manufacturing operation. And uh, so I've been delivering bottom line results to many different companies for uh, through, through process improvement solutions for over 20 years. And um, really what I like to tell people is my, my personal purpose and my company's purpose is really to empower and equip people for positive change. Uh, really the, the, the work that we do is a, all about developing and empowering people. Uh, and when we do that in the right way, uh, metrics begin to change and organizations begin to change and really amazing things start to happen. So I love to tell people that I'm really in the business to help develop people, right? And I think everybody in the room can agree with that when we talk about uh, lean, process improvement, Six Sigma, whatever it might be, that we're really talking about the development of, of people and being able to really um, empower people for positive change. So that's really why I do what I do. Now, before I get started, I'm actually going to stop sharing here and I'm going to reshare a different screen. Give me just one second. I'm going to reshare this one here. All right, there we go. Um, what I'd like to start out today is I want to actually engage all of you in this session with me. So I have a question for all of you. Um, and what I'd like for you to do is if you have your cell phone available uh, or your laptop in front of you, I'd like for you to pull that out. Uh, and I want you to go on to menti.com, uh, M-E-N-T-I.com. You can type it right into your browser in your cell phone. You can put it into your laptop. So type in menti.com and then use the code 92385322. When you, when you go to menti.com, it will ask you for that code. The code you can pop in there. I don't know, John, if we can throw that into the chat for anyone that is logged on. Um, yeah, yeah. Perfect. 92385322. Right here at the top it's, is the code. Yeah, it's showing you the code there. Uh, and I can I can probably copy the link and throw it into the chat if you need me to, John. But what I want you to do is I want you to answer this question. In three words, I want you to describe your company culture or the organization that you work in, the company that you run, the team that you're a part of. I want you to, to choose three words to describe the culture that you are currently working in. Okay, so, and I want you to be honest about it. I want you to really, really think about what are three words. If you were to think about the team that you work with, the people that you work with, what would, what would be the three words that would describe each, that would describe your culture? Is uh, everybody able to, to bring that up? Menti.com, yeah. nine, two, three, eight. There we go. We got, we got one uh, coming up here. Good. So I know you guys are getting it. Uh, so go ahead and type in three words that best describe your culture. And while you're doing that, I just want to talk a little bit about culture. Okay. So my, my real definition of culture is that it's the output or the result of the behaviors, the habits, the, the actions that are happening within your team, within your leadership, within your employees, uh, within your the, the office staff, the the, um, the the operational team, wh whoever it might be, the the nurses, the again whatever industry you're in, the actions, the behaviors, the the habits, those things that are happening within your work environment, the result of that is really the culture that you work in, right? So we're seeing words like passionate, we're seeing words like friendly, uh, progressive enthusiastic, right? These are positive words about your culture. I'm also seeing some other words on here like no respect, uh, overworked, um, aggressive, aged. So these are some really, really great uh, descriptive words of the outcome for your culture. And we're going to dive into this a little bit deeper as, uh, as I work through today's session. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about culture and the environment that you work in, and, and again, the outcome of the habits, the actions, 
the, the behaviors of your leadership team, of your uh, the people that work in your organization. And what I'll do with this is I'll, I'll also take a screenshot of this and I'll send this to John and that way he can, uh, he can get it out to everybody as well so you can see it. And we're gonna, if, if you haven't had a chance to get on here and finish this, feel free to continue that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop it back up at the end and we're gonna look at it again uh, at the end of my time today. So let me go back here real quick. There we go. There we go. All right. So I want to start today as we dive into the, the concept of avoiding the continuous appearance trap. I'm going to explain what that means here shortly. But I want to begin today with a true story. Okay, this is a true story about myself. And I mentioned this story in the book as well. So if you've read the book, you, you've probably already heard this. Uh, but I think it's a really important story to, to kind of set the tone for really what is continuous appearance. When I, when I say the, word, the words continuous appearance, what is that? So as a young, inexperienced production supervisor, uh, there was a time that I wanted to prove myself to upper management, right? So this was me, young, inexperienced, not really understanding what it means to, uh, to, to have a, uh, uh, to be a, a great leader, right? I'm new to the, to the, to the job. Um, I have a little bit of experience, but not very much. Uh, definitely at this time did not have a lot of lean or continuous improvement experience. So this was, this was also new to me. Uh, but there was a time that I wanted to prove myself. You know, I saw other leaders in the organization getting promoted ahead of me. You know, they were getting promoted into these positions. And I thought that if I could make a good enough impression early enough on that maybe I could climb the ladder at this company, that maybe I could be as successful as these other individuals, that I could maybe have a corner office in the, in the organization at one time, right? That I could be one of these executive leaders in the company. But, but how would I do it? What would I need to do in order to make a really good impression right away? Well, first of all, I need to learn what was important to management. I knew that. I knew, I, I saw these people, the executives, management, I saw them coming out of the front office, out onto the production floor, and I would watch them. And I knew that if I could learn what was important to them, and I could show them that I was able to do those things, then maybe I would be promoted, right? So, for example, they, they, as they came out onto the production floor, I watched as they would see these, these clean machines, these well-lit areas, and their eyes would light up, and they would, I could see that they were excited, you know, they would, they would see, the, and then they would, maybe some of the other areas that weren't so lit up, it, machines were more grungy or dirty, right, which is what my area looked like at that time, uh, not so much attention, right, the attention was really going to the, the areas where the, the machines were clean and, and the areas were well lit. Uh, I, I, I learned uh, that they liked visual boards, right, any type of visual board, that was up on the wall with, with charts and improvement activities. Uh, however, the charts, they had to be green, right? There was green and red, and they couldn't be in the red. If they were in the red, then that wasn't a good thing. They had to be in the green. So I, I knew that as well. Um, knowing this, right, knowing these things, paying attention to the stuff that was happening, uh, that, they were, that they were excited about, I got approval to spend some money in my area. Uh, and what we, what I did was I went out and I got some paint from the local hardware store. I had my, my team clean up the machines. We threw some paint on the machines. I, I put new lights in over the workstations to make it a little bit uh, brighter in those areas. Um, I, I put up a whiteboard and we, we made some charts for the area. And I, I was sure though, to make sure that my, my metric charts were had goals on it that were, were easy enough to hit for my team so that we could stay in the green, right? I threw some improvement activities on the board. Um, I even went up front and I got some, some of those buzzwords like 5S or leadership. And I, I printed out posters and I put those up in my area. Uh, and I, I, I remember spending some time out on the floor doing some of my own personal 5S. And, uh, which again, the team wasn't really involved in at that time. I had no idea how to really do 5S the right way. So uh, I, I was out there doing some personal 5S and I remember seeing tools scattered around the machine and around the workbenches. And I just, I just put, put them all in a tote and took them out of the area because I thought, well, these are, 
these are just scattered around, laying around. These guys must not need them because they're all locked out all over the place. And what I found was that I was actually taking away the tools that they needed to do their job, right? But I thought they were just cluttered. Um, and this sounds pretty terrible. I'm sure as you're listening to this, you're probably kind of cringing in your seat, like thinking, I can't believe that he would do these things, right? But I, just to make it even worse, because I was so busy trying to make a good impression for management, I stopped spending time on the production floor, right? I knew that all the leaders, all the managers, the people that would promote me, they were up in the conference rooms. And so I needed to spend more time in the conference rooms. So I stopped listening to my team and I started spending as much time as I could in the conference room with the rest of the leadership team. And over time, my team, instead of making their shipments, they started missing their shipments. And turnover was on the rise. People were wanting to leave my department. I started, nobody wanted to come into my department. No one was applying for my jobs within my department. My department was literally falling apart. See, my employees, they saw through those false intentions that I had as a young, inexperienced supervisor. I like to throw that out there because this is such a terrible story. <laughs> young, inexperienced, right? But my employees, they saw through these false intentions and they knew that I didn't really respect them, right? It was clear to them that I was there for myself and not for them. Now, there's an old saying in the US, I don't know, you'll have to tell me if this, is, uh, if this is the same in the UK, but there's an old saying in the US that you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. Anybody, anybody, is that a saying in the UK? <laughs> All right. So that's what I was doing, right? I, I had this, this pig that I was putting lipstick on, but guess who the pig was? This guy, the pig was me. You know, it wasn't my team, it wasn't my area. I was trying to mask and, and put on this impression, this, this appearance that everything was really, really good in my area. But the result of that was a, a very chaotic, a very uh, a terrible work environment for my team and a very, and, and the, the metrics showed, the KPIs showed, right? And ultimately uh, things fell apart and it was not a good thing. Now, again, I wanna mention that I was very young and inexperienced. I've learned a lot since those days, those days when I was a young production supervisor. A lot has changed over the years. Now, I, I, I did fail in my role as a young production supervisor at that company, okay? However, when I look back, I see this really as a success for me personally because of what I learned. The time that I take now to reflect back on those times when I really, really did not do well, uh, I, I have to reflect and I have to think about what, it, what are those things that I learned, right? I was creating and promoting this culture of what I call now continuous appearance, right? Rather than what you all know as continuous improvement. And in other words, I, I, would, I would consider that, I would deem that or, or title that fake lean, right? Some of us have heard that term, fake lean. So I was putting uh, the, the appearance on like everything was 5S and that, that everything that, that we were hitting our metrics and we had visual boards in place. And, and, but in, underneath all of that was a really terrible place to work. And that's not what lean is about. So let me explain this a little bit further. Um, earlier in my career, I worked for two companies. Okay, now this was at a different time, but I worked for two companies. And if you were to walk into either of these companies, you would see uh, very similar work environments as far as uh, at the surface level, okay? So both had visual management, similar KPIs or key performance indicators of safety, quality, cost, delivery, and morale, right? Both had similar org structures. Um, and in walking through these two companies, to be completely honest, it would be very dif difficult to tell them apart at the surface with their approach to even business solutions or process improvement solutions. It would be very difficult. But I will tell you from experience and being with, within both of these companies that one of those companies had a true culture of continuous improvement, a true culture to the core. And the other one had, again, what I call this culture 
of continuous appearance. Underneath the floor tape, underneath the pretty scorecards, the lean posters, is a very toxic culture where people hated to work. The company had high turnover. There was no instability. But this, this company at the surface level appeared to have it all together, right? But again, it struggled with these, these flavor of the month activities, which again, I don't know if that's a term in the UK, but in the US, a flavor of the month activity is something that maybe, you know, we put a program out there one month and then the next month it goes away and we put a new one out there and we try something different. And, uh, and, and, and so that this company was just filled with that, you know, and, and Lean had all these different names, right? Um, there, was, there was no real sustainment of any initiatives at this company. And so again, I'm sure some of you probably know exactly what I'm talking about because either you've experienced that yourself, right? Or potentially you're working in a company right now where you're experiencing this culture of continuous appearance at this very moment. Either way, I hope that you understand as we, as we walk through these next few slides, I hope you can really understand that difference between uh, what continuous improvement is and what continuous appearance is. And that's really my goal for today is to help you to understand that and also maybe start uh, asking yourself some questions that might really uncover what's underneath your culture. Now, based on my time spent within these two organizations, I learned some pretty important lessons. As I mentioned about my time as a young production supervisor, being in both of these companies, you can imagine being, being inside and having that insider look and being able to, to see the differences. I learned so much from these two companies. So let me show you a little bit about uh, those lessons that I learned. Now, this is going to be a very simple diagram, okay? And there's a lot of uh, details that fall underneath each one of these circles. But this very simple diagram, I think, will help to get across the, the, the beginning point of what it means to create and promote a true culture of continuous improvement. So leaders need to start by setting expectations. Okay, setting expectations. The next thing that they have to do after they set expectations is they have to enable action. They set those clear expectations up front, then they have to enable some kind of action, right? There has to be something that happens uh, once, they, once they've established those expectations. And finally, what they have to do is they have to sustain the results of those actions. So the, again, this is very simple. Right? There's no rocket science happening here, but set expectations clearly up front, enable that action, and then sustain the results. Now, if you were to set expectations and enable results, but you didn't sustain the results, if you it, it, or enable action and you didn't sustain the results, the change is not going to be sustained. So you're going to end up in that, that period of having these flavor of the month activities, right? We, we say we, we want to start this program. This is the expectation, right? And then, okay, let's go do it. But, there's, but if you don't have any kind of uh, sustainment of those, those actions, that's just going to fall apart. And then next month, we're going to try to put something else out there. Let's try something different this month. And then we enable action. But if there's no sustainment, it's just going to fall apart, right? So that's important that we have all, we have all three. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. But if, if, if I was to enable action, and I was to sustain the results. So if I go out to my team and I just tell them, you know, run this machine at, at, uh, at 50 parts an hour or uh, make sure that this, this um, go and clean up the, the operating room. But I don't, I never set expectations, right? I just enable the action. I tell them what to do. I go and I direct and I give them actions to go do. And maybe I have some kind of sustainment in place of those actions. Maybe I put some kind of audit in place or I train the team to those actions, but I never set expectations up front. I never gave clear expectations in the beginning. There's going to be a lack of organizational alignment, right? Different leaders are gonna be doing different things. There's no alignment there. And then the last one, if I was to put clear expectations out there, if I was to very clear give goals, if I was to very clearly give a vision for where we're going as an organization, and I put some kind of sustained action in place, like I put an audit out there, or I train the team members, or I have, uh, you know, uh, gamble walks or waste walks happening, 
uh, but I never enabled the action, I never enabled it with the team, then there's gonna be mediocre results. So I tell you all of these things because it's so important that we have all three of these, all three of these. We need to, as leaders, we need to be setting the expectation, we need to be enabling action of our team, and we need to be sustaining those results. Very important that we find the center point of all three of these areas. They're all necessary in order to create a true culture of continuous improvement. Now, in my book, Avoiding the Continuous Appearance Trap, I identify 12 questions that anyone can ask in any organization, in any industry, to uncover what's truly underneath a culture. Now, these 12 questions give really anyone the ability to assess their operation and begin taking action right away. But, you know, you have to ask why 12 questions, right? And, and why questions at all? Why, why would I lead, why would my chapters be questions, right? Why not simply give everyone a roadmap for success based on my experience at Company Continuous Improvement, right? The company that I worked at, in the book, I call it Company Continuous Improvement, but that company, you know, why wouldn't I just give all of you 10 steps to becoming a, a, a lean culture or 10 steps to, um, to becoming company continuous improvement? Why wouldn't I just give you that roadmap? Instead, instead of giving you that roadmap, I give you 12 questions. Now, John Shook, many of you know John, but John was the first American employee at Toyota's world headquarters starting in 1983 that helped Toyota uh, transfer production engineering and management systems from Japan to NUMI. And we're going to talk more about NUMI here in a little while. Some of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with, with what happened with NUMI, but we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit later. But John made this uh, statement, and I think it ties in really well with the answer of why 12 questions, right? So John said, lean management is very much about asking questions and trying things or encouraging other, others to try things. Lean management itself is not much about providing the right answers, but it's very much about asking the right questions, right? So back to my statement, if I was to give you a roadmap of all of my answers, right? Your first inclination would be, okay, I have all the answers, let's go implement it, right? You would wanna implement the solutions right away in hopes of creating a true culture of continuous improvement. However, if you were to do this, it would be detrimental to your organization. Trying to implement a roadmap of success from another organization will not work. It won't work. Now, I don't want to take away from what Toyota did. The Toyota production system is amazing. I teach it. I live by it. I think it's great. However, I would never tell you in, in, within your company, within your organization, to go do exactly what Toyota did. These are the tools that they used. Go apply them to your, your processes. Go apply them to your organization. I would never tell you that because it will be detrimental to your organization. And unfortunately, a lot of organizations try to do that. Now rather, what you have to ask yourself, what you have to ask you, your organization, you have to ask the right questions. By asking the right questions, it's going to become more of an evolutionary process of learning rather than, rather than this implementation process of correcting, right? Because you've been doing things a certain way for a certain amount of time. You're in a certain industry. You have a certain team. A certain, it's, it's a certain time it, that's different from Toyota, right? So if, if I was to give you a 10 step to become Toyota, You'd be trying to correct everything that you've already learned. You, you, it would be this implementation process of correcting, and that's not what we want. We want an evolutionary process of learning. We want you to evolve into a culture of continuous improvement. So this really becomes the beginning of scientific thinking in your organization, right? So what's the value of anyone reading my book and hearing about these two companies? right? One that was successful and one that was not successful. So under scientific thinking, our goal is for you to think about where you need to be in your situation, right? Where, where you are today, set the vision for where you need to be, 
develop some kind of a challenge, right? And then break that challenge down into smaller targets and move one by one through those targets toward that long-term vision, right? Sounds familiar? Maybe some of you are familiar with Kata. That's what we wanna do in this, in this scientific method of thinking. The questions that are laid out are really going to guide you and help you determine where to begin and then help you learn what works and what doesn't work along the way. So I'm gonna run through some of these questions with you today and we'll talk through them and uh, maybe have some discussion at the end, excuse me, even around, uh, around these questions. So the first question under, if you remember that, that diagram, right? Establishing those clear expectations. The first question that I would have for, for anyone in an organization, uh, in a team, for an organization itself, is are you content? Are you content? So when I was, I was working with a plant in uh, Northern Michigan at one time, and I had this lady say to me, uh, we don't need to change. Why, why are you even here? We've always done it this way. And this is the way that's always worked for us. Why do we need to change? And this comment from this lady has stuck with me over the years. And I've heard it often, to be honest. I hear it a lot. We've always done it that way, right? Why do we need to change? We've always done it that way. Um, I had an individual say to me at one company, our company makes enough money to not have to worry about those things. We don't need to change, right? Uh, but as Rear Admiral Grace Hopper said, that is the most dangerous phrase in our language. But why is that? Why do you think that's the most dangerous phrase? Well, if you're in an organization where things, where you're struggling to meet shipments, where you're struggling with quality problems, where you're struggling with, uh, with problems in, in uh, maybe in the operating room or in the waiting room, right? If, if you're struggling, well, then it might be pretty easy to argue why things need to change, right? It'd be easy to argue that the current way of doing things is not good. Um, you, you know, you could ask yourself easily, what's your defect rate? Right, is that good? Uh, how efficient are you at your job? Is that good? You know, so easily in, in an organization that's struggling, you, you could say, no, that's not good. We need to change, right? That would be pretty easy. But for some organizations, it may not be that easy, right? So if, you're, if your business is not performing well and you're losing sales, that's easy. But maybe you're fulfilling your mission. Maybe you, you are... Uh, performing well, right? In this case, it, it would be a little bit more difficult to understand why we would need to change, okay? It, it wouldn't be as clear cut. So if, if your output was top notch, if, you're, um, if you're, you're meeting all of your KPIs, right? So is that enough for you to stop innovating? Is that enough for you to stop reaching for more? I would say no. Other companies, your competition, right? They're racing to catch up and pass you by. So even standing still is in effect the same as moving backwards. We, we need to be uh, companies that are looking for opportunities to improve and get better. We can never become uh, content with the status quo. We can never become content with the way things currently are. Whether we're top notch and meeting our KPIs or we're struggling with quality, delivery, cost. Either way, we have to find ways to get better, to improve. I also wanna stop here and mention another uh, term that I hear very often when it comes to uh, discontentment with a status quo. I hear a lot of people use the term burning platform, right? Let's create a burning platform so that people want to change, so that they want to get involved, right? And I, I really don't like this term very much, and the, the reason why I say that is because it, it can really cause some unneeded fear and anxiety uh, within your company. And, that, and is that the type of culture that you want to create? Do you want a culture of fear? Do you want a culture of anxiety? No. We, rather than creating this culture of fear and anxiety, we want to create a culture of excitement and engagement, of innovation of looking for opportunities to, to get better and improve and, and be better than our competitor, right? So what I say instead of a burning platform is I say that we should create a compelling story, 
right? A compelling story. So a compelling story is really, it's a narrative. It's a story, a narrative that charts positive change over time. It, it demonstrates how potential solutions maybe fit into certain problems that you're experiencing. So you don't want to just say you don't have problems if you really do. You know, my recommendation would be to be honest with your team. If we, are, if we do have problems, then let's talk about them. Let's get them out there. Let's make them visual to the team so that they understand that we have problems. But if we don't have problems, then let's be real about what the story looks like. And I say if we don't have problems, everyone has problems. We'll talk about that in a little bit here too. But if, if you're meeting your KPIs, if, you're, if you're, um, you're, you're, you're doing good things as a company, you can still create a compelling story for change is, is my point. Right, because there are real competitors that are working hard to steal your business. You could create a compelling story around that. You know, maybe you work in an operating room and real lives depend on zero defect mentality. You can create a compelling story around that. So I have to ask you, you know, when, when you think about this, this issue of contentment in an organization, what's your story? As an organization, What's your compelling story that you can give to your team that's going to help them to get on board with change? It's going to help them understand the importance of continuous improvement. So that's the first question. Another question that organizations have to ask it themselves is, are you pursuing perfection? Now, this is a picture from the, uh, North, Manis the North Manitou uh, Sorry, the North Manistee River Trail. There's also a North Manitou Island that I backpack on. But this is the, uh, the, the North Country Trail. It's along the Manistee River Loop, Trail Loop, which is approximately 20 miles long in Northern Michigan. It's my favorite backpacking uh, trail by far. And uh, the first time that I took my daughter with me, I actually printed a, I have a daughter. She, uh, she is 20 as of yesterday, just turned 20 getting ready to graduate from college. Uh, and um, she, this was a number of years ago, I took her backpacking with me on the, uh, man, in, on, the uh, river, on the trail here. And uh, when I took her, I printed this map of the trail. I'm gonna show you a picture of it here in just a minute, but I printed this map. Um, and I, for me personally, I've, tr I've backpacked this trail many times. In fact, I backpack it minimum of twice a year. So I've been on this trail many times. I don't necessarily need a map to know where the trail is, right? But this was my daughter's first time on the trail. So of course I wanted to print a map out. I wanted her to, to be involved in us deciding kind of where we go on the trail. Um, and so I, I, I asked my daughter uh, where we should go. And this is the map itself. And you can see the green dot here. That's our starting point on the trail. Uh, and, and we would go north along the trail. You can see the red dotted line. That's actually the trail itself along the east side uh, of the river itself. So I pulled this map out and I laid it on the hood of the car in front of her. And I said, okay, her name's Taylor. I said, Taylor, where would you like to go from here? Here's where we are. I pointed out the, the green dot there. I said, here's where we are now. Where would you like to go from here? She was like, dad, I don't care where we go. <laughs> and I, I kind of laughed, I chuckled a little bit. Uh, and as a dad, right, I, I, I gave her the best response that I could come up with. I said, Taylor, if you don't care where we're going, then it really doesn't matter which direction we go. Let's, let's just take off in any direction then. If we, if we don't care where we're going, then, then let's just take off, right? And then I went on to explain to her that we need to know where we're heading so that we have direction, right? Direction is going to give us purpose. And we don't want to just go out and not have purpose, not direction. We're going to get lost. We're going to be, you know, who knows where we'll end up. We need direction, right? So that's what I told her. I want to show you this quick video uh, of Alice in Wonderland. This is an oldie here, uh, but I want to show it to you because I, this is exactly what I was thinking when she told me it doesn't matter, right? So let me play this for you. Now let's see. Where was I? Hmm. I, I wonder which way I ought to go. 
thank you. Oh, no, no, no. Thank you, but, but I just wanted to ask you which way I ought to go. Well, that depends on where you want to get to. Oh, it really doesn't matter. As long as I can... Then it really doesn't matter which way you go. You didn't realize you were going to be watching cartoons today, right? <laughs> All right. Um, so while standing next to the car with our backpacks lying next to us, I explained to my daughter, Taylor, the importance of charting and communicating our course prior to setting out, right? If we do not first set that course of where we're going, then we'll be walking with no end in mind, right? And, and if we don't communicate it to the rest of the team, right, if I just took off, I didn't tell my daughter where we were going, then no one else in the group knows where we're going, right? How will we ever know that we've arrived if we have no idea where we're heading? Um, some of you know the term true north, right? True north is a, is a lean term that's used very frequently. Uh, but when, when reading a compass, if, you, if you're not familiar, you can always determine which way is north. And by knowing that, you can determine whether you're on path or you're off path, right? We, we may not know what's between us uh, or our destination, but at least we have this sense of direction, right? We, we may not know what's going to happen along the trail, but we have a path and that's important. So again, I asked her where should we go and she pointed at, on the map that she wanted to go to the suspension bridge, which is a, a point on the map on the trail where you actually cross over the river. And now we had our true north, right? We had a direction, we had a purpose, we knew where we were going, right? And if I wouldn't have done that with her, we didn't set our course prior to setting out. We may have never been able to take this amazing picture together and have this amazing memory, right? But getting back to why we're here, most organizations may never reach that true north, right? We were able to reach it, as you can see from this picture. True north may not be something that's attainable. But pursuing perfection is going to give you opportunities to learn as you're pointed and traveling in the right direction, right? You could lose your way at times. You could be off your trail. But then you can refocus your efforts on that true north, right, on that perfection. You can refocus your efforts, get your eyes back on that true north, and get back on your path. And that's why it's so important that we are always pursuing perfection. So you have to ask yourself, are you pursuing perfection? Okay, that's another question. Here's another one. And a huge contributor to the appearance trap. It's leadership, right? It's not the sole contributor, but understandably, leaders play a huge part in the appearance trap. Especially when we look at where leaders are spending their time and how they're behaving. Right? So how do we change the behavior of an organization? Well, we, we start that by changing the behavior of its leaders. Another quick video, you're going to find out I love these quick little videos because they, they have so, much, so many lessons behind them. Uh, this is, again, from one of my favorite movies. Uh, you, you'll, you'll get a kick out of this one. So the difference between a boss and a leader. Again, asking ourselves, how are our leaders behaving? Pretty intense. Uh, a Gallup study found that 50% of people who leave their jobs do so to get away from bad leaders. 70% of employees are not engaged at work. And when they studied managers, they found that 51% are not engaged 
and this is what's crazy to me, 14% are actively disengaged. That means that they're intentionally sabotaging the work that's being done at their organization or within their team, right? So, so poor leadership can seriously affect employees' morale and can even cause the company's bottom line to plunge. Now, now don't get me wrong here. All leaders are not bad. And I will say that most leaders are not intentionally causing the appearance trap, right? If you remember back to my story from earlier, I mean, me as an, as an inexperienced uh, supervisor, you could say I was kind of intentionally causing those problems, right? I mean, because I was thinking about myself there. Now, not all leaders are intentionally doing that. Some of them are really hoping to do the right thing, right? They, they, they just simply don't know. They're coming to work. They're trying to do a good job. They're trying to be a good leader. But they simply just don't know, right? Maybe they were promoted into a leadership position because they were really good at running a machine. Maybe they were really good at, um, at working with people, so they, they were promoted. But they, never, they don't really have any, any good leadership or management experience, right? So you have to ask yourself, if you want a true culture of continuous improvement, then what needs to change in order to make that happen? This is a, a great definition uh, that I love to bring out for this particular conversation. But the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So how many companies think that they can continue to manage in the same way, doing the same thing over and over again, but expect different results? You know, I mentioned another one of the questions, which is where are leaders spending their time? One of the greatest barriers to establishing a true culture of continuous improvement is that leaders avoid spending time in the place where the value-add work is being done. Now, I was once working with a plant manager who would not leave his office. He refused to go walk on the production floor. And when I asked him why, he told me that, I, he, he said, I can't go onto the production floor, not even for a minute, because I get bombarded with questions. A five minute planned walk turns into two hours and I just don't have time for that. Can you believe that he said that? I mean, some of you are shaking your heads because you know that feeling, right? However, this is a huge problem. I mean, it, it seems to me that like looking in from the outside that his team really just didn't have clarity around what the expectations were, right? There, there were no clear expectations for them. They had questions. And, and as a plant manager, shouldn't it alarm you that your team feels like they're in the dark? Shouldn't that create more questions for you about why am I getting bombarded when I walk out on the floor, right? And as a leader, you have to be willing to change your behavior, no matter how hard it is. You can't continue to manage in the same way that you always have and expect something different to happen. You have to be intentional to change your habits. Now, have you ever wondered why, you know, those flavor of the month activities, why lean improvements maybe come and go? In order to support a new business system, we have to have a different leadership system. We have to have a different management system. And if you don't, it's going to fall apart. If you manage the same way with the same meetings, the same metrics, you're going to get the same behaviors, the same beliefs, and the same results. So unless we as leaders change the way that we manage, then we're gonna fall into that continuous appearance trap. And if you want to succeed and achieve a true culture of continuous improvement, then you need to manage differently, All right? We started in the beginning with this, but your culture is an outcome of what you do, what you say, how you do things, your behavior, your habits. It's about the ways that your business practices values, your leadership actions. It's your attitudes, right? It's how you show up every day. So if, if, if that's the case, if we know that, if we know that the culture is an outcome of those things, then why not be intentional about what the culture will become? Why not be intentional about the inputs? If we know that's the output, why not be intentional? Why not put the right inputs in so that we get the culture that we're looking for, right? We can't, we can't just let it happen. We, we will have a culture, every company has a culture, but do we want that culture to just be what it, what it is by accident? 
or do we want to create the culture that we're that we're looking for that's going to support a continuous improvement environment by having the right inputs right we can wish and hope that we're going to have a good culture but if it's not really if if if, if that's if that's really the way that we the, the culture will become what it is, right? I mean, it, if, if you want to change your culture, you need to start with the little things, all those little inputs. So let, let me just show you what I mean, all right? I want to show you another quick video um, from a gentleman who talks about the inputs, okay? The inputs, the little things. And that's what we're going to that's what we're gonna spend a little bit of time on next. Some of you may be familiar with this video. It's a great one. 2014 uh, commencement speech at the University of Texas by Admiral William McRaven. If you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made. That you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. The Admiral said the little things matter, right? All of those little things are gonna add up to the big things. That's so key, it's so important. Those little inputs every single day they're going to add up to big change, and that's important, right? So what are those little things, right? What are those little daily incremental actions that you should be doing in order to, to have the outcome that you're looking for, right? Do you have simple tasks that you're completing every single day that will eventually lead to massive change in your organization? So many of you have heard the term standard work. Many of you know what standard work is. You've applied standard work in your operation or work construction, or you know, maybe you have other names for it. Uh, but standard work is, is one of the most powerful lean tools, right? It, it, it's the documented and current best way uh, to do a particular task or a procedure or a process. Now, leader standard work, very similarly, is a set of daily and weekly actions tools, behaviors that leaders can apply to build and sustain a continuous improvement culture, right? So if you as a leader were to go out and you were to ask your workforce to follow standard work as part of their process, which a lot of lean leaders do, right? Then why would you not be doing the same yourself with your leader standard work? If you don't have and follow leader standard work, then you give the impression to your team that you don't believe in the value of standard work, right? And worse yet, you, you could give the impression that maybe you're somehow above needing leader standard work, right? You, you're asking them to do it, but maybe you're above it. Airline pilots use standard work. I was just in Alaska uh, a couple weeks ago, and literally the airline, the, 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 we flew on a plane, a small bush plane, the pilot pulled out a laminated checklist his leader standard work. And he went through and checked them off. And then we took off. And I'll tell you, I felt a lot safer knowing that he covered his leader standard work, right? Airline pilots use it. Surgeons use it. Astronauts have a variety of checklists and predictable procedures, right? That they have to follow. I'm, so I have to ask, you know, you have to ask yourself, like, am I above astronauts and surgeons? And am I above that? The answer should be no, right? We, if we're asking our team members to do it, and if it's important for an airline pilot, then we should be doing it as well. So once you've established those daily, weekly actions and behaviors, then all leaders and team members have to ask themselves um, if those actions are generating small, simple improvements. Are those actions generating small, simple improvements? And as you can see on this chart, they need to be incremental, right? Every single day. You can't take a break for a month and then get back to it again and play catch up. It's got to be incremental every single day. So are you generating small, simple improvements? Another really, really great question. 
right? I had the opportunity this past year to visit the Grand Canyon. Uh, and, you know, anyone that has been to the Grand Canyon, anybody been to the Grand Canyon in the U.S.? Anybody in the room? I think I see one. Yeah, a couple. Okay, good. So uh, it's amazing. Breathtaking. The Colorado River winds throughout the Grand Canyon. And over time, with persistence, the Colorado River has cut through rock and help form what we now know as the Grand Canyon, right? And, and, and I, I have to, again, I have to ask myself, what if we use the same persistence within our organizations? Can you imagine the results that you would experience if you had an unwavering, passionate consistency to your improvement activities, just like the Colorado River cutting through rock over time and creating the Grand Canyon? When I think about these small continuous improvements, I, I can't help reflect, uh, I can't help but reflect on Paul Akers and FastCap. A lot of you know Paul, but Paul does an amazing job at communicating the simplicity of lean. However, if you know anything about Paul, you also know about his unwavering, passionate persistence for small improvements, right? Yes, it's simple. But simple doesn't always mean easy, right? And, and, and again, as Paul would tell you, um, I mean, it, it's, it takes work. He arrives at work every single day early with a relentless drive for continuous improvement on the small things on a daily basis. He's out there uh, on the floor with his cell phone, taking pictures and videos, and he's putting those out to the team and letting them celebrate uh, every single day you know, sometimes I think he's more excited than the people are about the improvements that they're doing uh, at FastCap. But every single day, he's celebrating those small, simple improvements. And that's consistent. They know that it's coming. So if you're generating these small, simple improvements, or if you're not generating those small, simple improvements, either way, the next question that you have to ask yourself is who's accountable? Who's accountable, okay? So I want to I want to shift to uh, a new me for a second. John, can you remind me? Do we have until twelve thirty or until one? Or sorry, do we have uh, five more minutes or do we have thirty five more minutes? We unfortunately only have five minutes more, Patrick, on, uh, with this particular session. Uh, okay. We've got a, a, another appointment with the group. Um, so if we could, it's you know, I, I want to say that these twelve questions are all in Patrick's fantastic book here. Yeah. <laughs> And if and we've got to find, I think you don't have to make all twelve to today, but um, no, 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 they're all in the book, yeah. They are all in the book, yeah. So yeah. I, I'm hitting on just a few of them today. Oh, yeah, you, you, you don't want to give give it all away, right? No, no, no. <laughs> um, but I do want to I do want to give a few minutes for questions if anybody yes, has any what questions. I was about so what we're you about could, so if you far. could wrap up in five minutes and then we'll do Q and A, Patrick. Thank you. Yeah, please, please. Thank, thank you. Um, so, you know, well, some of the things that we've talked about today, uh, I'm going to skip over new me because I, that that's, uh, kind of helps drive home accountability. Uh, but there's so many questions that, that, um, you can ask yourself. And I want to just in summary of what I've talked about, I want to remind everybody that there's no cookie cutter approach to continuous improvement. It has to be a scientific, uh, approach. It has to be a, an approach of reflection and learning as you go, um, and, and I think as leaders, if we support our team members in becoming a learning organization, an organization that asks questions and experiments toward learning the answers to those questions, that's the kind of organization that we want to promote. And the culture, of, the, the culture that's going to result from that is a culture of true continuous improvement. Um, what questions do I have uh, from, from anybody? And you can drop them into the chat if you're if you're on the. Uh... I'll, I'll just open up the warm things up a little bit, Patrick. That was fantastic uh, talk. Thank you very much. Walk back a little bit. Um, and the first question about are you content? It made me think. Um, would we? What is? Is there a right answer to that question? Because is it Steve Jobs that said, "Stay hungry, be a little bit this." Complete contentment's not a good thing, obviously. Otherwise, you, you don't want to change. Yeah, that's a great question, John. So, 
you know, th this is, uh, you know, the, the, there's, a, there's an argument out there about, uh, about stability versus, you know, discontentment, right? If I'm always, if I'm always discontent with everything, when is, where does the stability come? And, you know, there is a, th that is important. And really what that looks like is more of a, uh, of a step, uh, step process. So once I, I, I should always be uh, discontent with the status quo. And when, when I'm discontent, I'm looking for opportunities to improve. And once I've made a change and I've improved a process, I need to pause and take time to stabilize, update standard work, train the team, understand the changes that have been made, accept that, uh, and, and pause, create stability. But that, but that, that current state now becomes your, your, uh, you know, your, your next springboard. You're now looking for the next best thing, the next improvement. And that's what it means to, to not be content. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just was uh, organizing the questions. Uh, yeah. Cola, could you come up to the, to the microphone, please? This is Cola Alutamehin, uh, who, who actually flew in from Nigeria. He's, he's ah. based in London, but was working in Nigeria and for this, for this conference. So... Uh, I wish I could be there to meet you in person. I, I wish I could. It will still happen someday. It will still yeah. happen. Thank you so much for your, for your session, which is really good. What I'm, my question is based on turning around that are you content question. Say, for example, one of your clients, you ask the question, are you content? And they say, we're not content. We want change. But then you're having to chase them around that. You told me you're not content. Now you are not content because they've told you they're not content and they're not taking steps further. Now you're not content. How would you handle that? If, Does that make sense? So I want to make sure I understand your question. You're, you're saying if you're, you, would you want your, your uh, suppliers to, your, or your customers to be content? Is that what you're asking? What, what I'm saying is, is that what you're delivering to them, the service you're so, delivering so to them? As a consultant, you're dealing with your clients and you say, are you content with your results? Oh, no, yeah. we're not. We actually do need you. We would like to have you uh, with what we're doing. And, okay, let's take the next step. They're not. Now, you, as a consultant, you're not content. Sure. What do you do? Uh, well, again, I think there has to be opportunity to, to uh, stabilize, too, right? I mean, as a, as a consultant, you know, I have a, I have a specific process that I follow in order to provide the best service to my clients, right? Now, I'm always looking for ways to improve the way that I provide service to my clients, right? I have to watch the, the trends that are happening in the world and, and opportunities to, even, to get even better at, and provide even better service. So I'm always looking for opportunities to get better at, as a consultant. But when I deal with a, with a client, um, I'm always looking for, you know, what problem are we trying to solve? And once I know what problem that I'm trying to solve, the approach to solving that problem um, should be very, uh, very straightforward. It, it's, it's not unwavering. It's, yeah. it's a very stable approach to solve that problem. So I don't know if that helped answer your question or not. It, I think it's our job not to be too happy ever. <laughs> I suppose yeah, so. Never, ever. It's all as dealing with that. We're not allowed to be happy. <laughs> If I didn't, if I didn't answer the question properly, please send me a send me an email, maybe with some clear, and I'll, and I'll do my best to answer the question. No worries, no worries. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you, Cola. Uh, Patrick, uh, Chris, I'll cook it. Patrick, uh, oh. <laughs> thank you. Wow. So my you question. Are knighted. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I read a story recently where by uh, somebody. Uh, probably met a senior executive of a company on a, well, sat next to them on an aeroplane and said what they did. They were a lean consultant, lean coach. And the senior executive said, I'd like you to visit my company and spend 30 minutes telling us what lean is all about and how we can adopt lean. So he said, certainly. So he went to this management briefing where all of the senior directors were around the table and he was given 30 minutes to describe what lean is about, embracing change, all of this kind of stuff. And they thanked him very much. And then the follow-up 30-minute presentation was, was about risk management. Uh, 
reducing risks, eliminating risks. And this guy suddenly realized that there's a lot more knowledge and shall we say expertise in managing risks than there is about embracing continuous improvement cultures. And he realized that it kind of parachuted into an organization that was more focused on, on managing and reducing and eliminating risk than it was about embracing change. And uh, just wondered if you have your thoughts about producing a shift away from controlling risk to actually embracing the possibilities of change, occasionally suffering some mistakes, having some failures, but looking at the bigger picture. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think it has to be to, I, I one and the same. I mean, any, any time that I'm improving, I'm, I'm normally asking myself, what problem I, am I trying to solve, right? So what, what risk you know, is there if there's a problem? And if I'm continuously improving, if I'm always looking for opportunities to get better, I'm always looking for ways to reduce risk. Um, I'm always looking for ways to, you know, to, to manage that risk. I mean, you, you're never going to completely eliminate risk, but I, I almost think it's one and the same. And, and if, if that's the question you're asking, whether it's one or the other, I would say, you know, they, they kind of go together. Would you missed, agree? missed opportunities as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I think you've kind of brought it together and kind of created this shift in them that you're actually two sides of the same coin and they are playing with the same coin and they can quantify it as risk or quantify it as improvement. I, yeah. The techniques cross over perfectly well. Yeah, I, I don't think, you know, sometimes I think that consultants make things sound really com complex when they don't need to be. You know, I, I think that sometimes uh, people tend to create complexity and we're human. So that, that's normal for humans. We try to complexify things. But really what we need to do is, is figure out how, how, to, how to make it simple. At the end of the day, you're trying to reduce risk. You're trying to reduce and eliminate problems. Uh, you know, your, your approach to doing those things is probably very similar, right? What, what problem are we trying to solve? What risk are we trying to minimize? And what are the things engaging with the team who's maybe involved in those processes that are risk adverse or that are problems, uh, engaging with them and, and helping them be part of the solution to that. You know, it's the same whether we're talking about risk aversion or problem solving or, you know, or again, you know, what's important to the customer? Well, it's important that we have these specific pieces, you know, within our product or our service. Okay. So what problem are we trying to solve? We're trying to eliminate the, the risk of, not hitting that or not getting those things to the customer maybe you know i, I mean it, i think it's it's really the same approach either way that works yeah. for me thank you okay absolutely can, you hear me, Patrick? can i answer that I tell my, absolutely oh the, i tell my clients all the time on the back of our that this is brian, brian bullets brian the real the real risk in life for business is living risk free I tell them that all the time, and that gets them to think about take a risk. If you don't take a risk, you don't learn nothing. Yeah. And I think we live in a world mm. that is too much, too much uh, risk adverse. Let's get out there and take the risk. Mm. You can put that in your next book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Right, hi Pat. I don't, as you see, I don't have to kneel down, which is quite good. My size. Hi Patrick. Uh, John Rooney. Now, a couple of times as you've gone through this, you've talked about new me. Now, yes. something we're actually talking about new me in our presentation on Thursday. Oh, good. So, um, you know, we were 40 years in the automotive industry, so right up to it. And we worked for Opel Vauxhall in the UK, which was obviously GM for many, many years. Why do you think everybody went to new me to learn this wonderful concept framework, everything else that went with it? But when they took it back to GM and they took it back to Opel Vauxhall in Europe, why was it not a success, as successful as Toyota? Yeah, good, good, good question for sure. Um, you know, and, and that goes back to, I think, a lot of the questions that, that I asked and a lot of the questions that were laid out. Um, you know, again, every, every team, every organization is different the time frame is different right now the industry is the same right uh but the team's different the time's different uh there's 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 so many differences so i, I think that the team itself whoever it is that's trying to adopt the the those principles into their organization has to ask themselves those those same questions and they have to be real and honest about the answers 
and every solution is going to look different. So I think that maybe why some organizations weren't as successful is because they are trying to um, adopt the same solutions rather than adopt the process of getting to the solutions. The solutions are going to be different. The tools are going to be different, right? I, I don't just I don't just adopt Kanban into my organization because Toyota did it. What was the problem that I'm trying to solve? Why why do I need Kanban, right? Now, do I have an inventory problem? And you know, maybe the maybe I'm going to use Kanban cards. Maybe I'm going to use electronic Kanban. Maybe, uh, but you know, I have to first. I have to understand what problem I'm trying to solve, and then through an evolutionary process of learning, I have to get to the solution. So I think. You know, what I've seen with a lot of organizations is that, that they try to adopt the solutions into their organization versus teaching the process of learning and being open to the experiment and experimentation and developing their own solutions. Okay, that, thank you. Does that help answer? Yeah, well, yeah. I think my answer would be that you tried, they tried to put processes in into a culture that was totally different, but then take yeah. the culture into account. Yeah, the, yeah, absolutely. The people are completely different. The culture is different. The, the behaviors are going to be different in the U.S. versus in Japan, right? But in the U.K., they're, they're going to be different, right? I'm going to use words that you guys don't use. So you got, I'm not going to put a process into the U.K. that you're not a part of creating, you know, procedures and, and processes. I need you to be involved in it. I need you to create something that's going to work for your team. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. One more. Uh, we've got one last time for one last question, and it's Fiona Bennett, who's come up from uh, from Brighton on the south coast of England. Ah, okay. She's, she's uh, <laughs> the other end of the country from me. Hi, Patrick. Thanks for the um, the talk, and it's actually kind of a segue from the previous question about culture. Um, I've worked with some big multinationals that, um, and, and quite recently, uh, with an American-owned company. Um, like many others, has grown through mergers and acquisitions and then decided to do uh, without any kind of culture change. It's just mm. you know, legacy businesses operating <clears throat> in, in different countries around the world. Um, how do you deal with them with, um, my, well, they tried to implement lean thinking as a whole across the world, failed miserably um, because they hadn't taken into account the different cultures in the different countries. And yeah. also across the different functions. Um, so from operations and manufacturing through to finance, HR, legal, IT, etc. With that melting pot of different cultures, different professions, uh, different leadership styles across all these legacy systems, um, what, what would be your approach to uh, uh, having that situation? Yeah, that, that's a that's a really, really great question. I, I think uh, you know, I, I was actually involved in an organization that had many different acquisitions, very similar to what you're talking about. Uh, and, you know, that's always difficult for any organization to deal with, uh, is bringing, bringing other company cultures, you know, into your organization. Now, this particular organization had a vice president of Lean. They had uh, uh, group managers. Um, you know, they, they had, Lean was embedded in the organization. Uh, from the top all the way down. They had processes, procedures, they had training, train the trainer, they had, you know, uh, very uh, standard visual management for each plant, uh, everything. So when they did an acquisition, going into, I was actually part of going into one of these companies and helping them to learn the, the, the continuous improvement um, methodology that this company had developed. And I, you know, one of the first things that I did going into this organization was I sat down with every single person in the plant, first shift, second shift, and third shift. And I just, and I asked them questions about, you know, what, what are some things that are going really good in this plant? What are some things that are not going so good? What are some things that maybe need to improve? I asked them those questions. And just by, just by respecting the employees enough to ask them that question, and then taking some of the things that they think are going really, really good and showing, showing them those results after we collected that data, and then taking that information and combining it together with what the company had already established as their continuous improvement way of doing things, their methodology, it allowed that plant to, 
the, the people in that plant to accept it a lot easier because they saw that, they're, that they were being listened to, that what's important to them was important to the company that had just acquired them. And so just by that alone, just by listening to them and, and taking some of their input and combining it, they saw that there was some flexibility and that they weren't going to lose ground on all the hard work that they had put in in the years prior. You know, this company was going to listen and, and was going to respect the fact that they had good ideas. And so, I, I you know, again, that's there's probably a, a very longer answer to your question because there's a lot of different things that I could say about that. But I think just listening to the people and understanding them, really seeking to understand and then applying solutions that are uh, that are, um, you know, uh, in, involved with everyone, not just someone coming in telling you what to do. Great, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Right. Well, um, that was great. We had four or five very interesting questions there. I'm sorry if uh, we, uh, anybody else uh, had the burning questions, but Patrick uh, can be found. Um, your email address, Patrick, I'm not mistaken, is uh, patrick.adams at no, patrick. no, it's patrick at patrickadamsconsulting.com. Um, you can also grab, find me on LinkedIn. Uh, our website is leansolutions.com. Uh, but, you know, by all means, if you have questions, shoot me an email. I would love to, or message me on LinkedIn. I'd, LinkedIn, I'd love to yeah. You, 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 you're pretty active on LinkedIn. You, you'd reply to people if they, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. Um, well, we're going to wrap up now from Cambridge, England. And uh, we're at the uh, Granta Center, which is also home of the Welding Institute. And uh, as Mike Russell there, that's joined us with the Welding Institute. Um, we've got some uh, variety of uh, industries and, uh, and nationalities here. And we will have over the next couple of days with the, uh, with 